Feel free to correct and write yourself notes. It is a learning endeavor. Okay, so if you recall, you've got enough time graph. And I hope you started with the EBT. And that is that max occurs at endpoints are critical number J. All right, we're going to gather some candidates and then reject them. Um, F endpoints, obviously, are x equals 7 and negative 7. Critical numbers are where F double or F prime and 0 are undefined, and that's at x equal negative 5. Negative one and five. What about three? It said there's a vertical tangent to us. Is that a critical number? Yes. Okay. Why do you say it's a critical number? Because what? The derivative is undefined there. I think you best think again. Derivative is right there, yeah? yeah? Do you see a point there? Yeah. So do you mean the slope of that graph is undefined there? And therefore you mean the second derivative doesn't exist there? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll say it again. Is three a critical number? It is not. It's for the first derivative exists there. It is right there. The point is there. You mean the second derivative. Because there's a vertical tangent on the first derivative. The second derivative is undefined there. Three is not a critical number. You would see the point for including it as a critical number. It is not. All right. Now, that said, you have five candidates. That's a lot. Let's reject some, shall we? Um, what I want you to do real quick just to get started, this is not the proof, but I want you to sketch a rough doodle for F right underneath this. Would you just put a point down at, say, at negative 7, F starts there. Would you give me a sketch of what F would look like based on that starting point in terms of increasing and decreasing behavior and how much? That will guide us. It is for our benefit only. It is not a proof, nor is it justification for answers. It is just to kind of get us a feel, all right? So we have something like that. Increasing, decreasing. Hard to say exactly how much. These areas are pretty close to each other. I think you'll agree, yeah? So increasing, decreasing, not sure how much. Increasing, flat increasing. Do we all agree with the, the function, what it probably looks like? You with me? Yeah. All right, cool. Now then, let's throw out some candidates. Um, is the endpoint negative 5 a max? Is that a max? Why not? What makes that? Now, endpoints are hard, okay? So we haven't done this a lot. They do it a lot in college, a little more in college, but we don't do this much for the AP test. Why is that endpoint not a max? Because F increases after, right? That's what makes it a non max. So Let's say not 5 because F increases after. How do we know F increases after? It, because the slope is positive or the derivative is positive, yeah? All right, what about at 5, negative 5? Is that a good candidate for a max? Negative 5 is a possible max. Do you agree? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to leave that in. What about negative 1? Not negative one because the derivative goes negative to positive, so that's actually a min. So it's not really a candidate for an absolute max if it's a relative min. Uh, what about five? 
not five because that prime does not say it again. Yeah, f increases after or f prime does not change signs. In other words, it's not a relative max change positive to negative. And what about the far right end point seven? Is that a possible absolute max? Yeah, it's a darn good one. The derivative is positive before that point. All right, so our only candidates now are negative five and positive seven. The hardest part for me by far was that I know I I know that negative uh, seven is big, but how do I say it? I mean, so let's let's just talk it through and then figure out how to say it well. That is the hardest part of this problem to get. So why do you why do we say the curve is greatest at seven? Just in your own words, and then we'll fan through that. Because what? Yeah, exactly. I feel like it increases it increases more than it decreases. Yeah? Are you with me? Yeah. Okay. So increases more than it decreases. Increases five. Right. Increases on when does it increase? Negative seven to no no no. From negative one to seven, from negative one to seven, it increases more than it decreased on when it decreased. When did it decrease? Negative five to negative one. Yeah. Are you with me? Are you with me? Cool. Great. Okay. Now, why do you say that? In terms of calculus, what tells you how much it increases or decreases? The area. Okay, perfect. Love it. The area on negative 1 to 7 is greater than the area on, you're getting this. See, this is, you're just kind of honing, you're refining it. I love it. All right. And then last but not least, what's the calculus to say, here's the area. The integral. Um, area, though, I wouldn't, so this is where I then lost the point. It's, I was so close. I said, oh, the area on negative 1 to 7, negative 1 to 7 of the derivative is greater than the area on uh, negative 5 to negative 1 of the derivative. Now, and I thought about that, and I thought, well, that's kind of a stupid conclusion. Isn't this area obviously going to be bigger than the area? Why? Well, that's, no, 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 that's negative. negative. Of course it's going to be bigger. It's positive. So what I, I mean, without respect to sign, you know, and so it really should be more like the amount of area without respect to sign is greater than. That's like the perfect thing. Is that great? I don't Okay, are you with me? Oh, five points there. Uh, this really is, when I say this, I'm, I'm focusing on you people who are shooting for perfection. I mean, that's, practically nobody gets a perfect score on the AP test because of this kind of thing. That's, that's why it's uh, so difficult, because there's always one in there that separates the great from the awesome. Um, that is good. Any other questions on 72B? 20s. 20s. 25s. 1800s or approaches. 18 was a replacement you need to answer to. Okay, do I have that somewhere? Okay, 18. Um, so, x cubed minus x. Uh, I'm going to dump b. I did, well, uh, let's see. Maybe I'll dump b. Do you agree that this is x times x squared minus 1? So it has roots at plus 1, minus 1, and 0 before absolute value. And with absolute value in A, so absolute value, we don't, we don't 
track the six track the green team. So I would love it if you got those, but we'll see. Um, what happens in A when that absolute value does it? It causes a reflection like this. Sweet? Cool. All right. So G prime, I'll just going to go straight so I see far as derivative. This far left region, um, is that negated F or normal F? Negated. All right. So what I want you to do then, just to cut to the chase, is take the derivative and negate it. What's the derivative negated? Okay, and that's for negative infinity up to negative 1. Do not include because we have a sharp turn there. In this region, from negative 1 to 0, negated derivative or normal derivative? Mm, All right, so that's 3x squared minus 1, negative 1 to 0. Uh, here, negated or normal? Mm. Negated, negative 3x squared plus 1. And then back to normal, right? Okay, uh, get back to that. Um, I'm not going to do the derivative part of it because it's not a big idea and it's not worth the practice it would take to get through it. But I do want to talk about the pre-calculus. What does absolute value do when it's on the x? It doesn't change the graph the same way. So think the big, the big idea conceptually is absolute value does nothing to any positive and changes the behavior of any negative. But in this case, I'm not talking absolute value on the y values. I'm talking about what it does to the x values. So let's go over here. When x is positive, where is that on the graph? Up, down, or right, left? Right, left. Okay, so what can you tell me uh, about the, where will the graph not change at all? The whole right side will be exactly the same. This will be unchanged. What will change is the negative x's. What will the negative x's look like? Yeah, they'll look exactly like this side because the negative x's are going to be made positive. And positive x's then would yield the same positive y. So when you do a absolute value on the x, you get reflection across the y-axis because positive x's and negative x's behave the same. <coughs> this part of the graph never even happens. You never get to see what happens when a negative x goes in. It's just two sides of a positive curve. You with me? Uh, let's not sweat the derivative, though, because we have so much to do. You could, if you want to, you could get it here. All right, questions on 20 now. Is 20 still the question? All righty. You're so quiet for a Friday before the three-day weekend. Are you exhausted? Yeah. Long week. Long week. All right. Uh, yeah, 20, there's not that question. Never mind. Okay. Uh, 20, you got y equals x to the fourth. And y equals 4. x to the fourth is like a parabola, but steeper growing and flatter inside where between negative 1 and 1. We're looking like that, yeah? If we close it off with y equals 4. Uh, it's revolved around the y-axis. When we revolve around the y-axis, we use x or y? Which one? I don't think we use the y. It's not? No. Oh, this is, I'm doing 73. God oh, it. Sorry. Thank you for stopping me sort of fast. Not really fast, but. Okay, 20. Yep. All right. That's 20 on 73 if you need it. I was like, I have a copy. Y equals 2e to the cosine x. Did you get the derivative? Okay. Y prime is? Um, negative 20. All right. So the derivative of the outside and the derivative of the inside. I'm down. Okay. So now for the second derivative, can I just take the derivative of each piece or do I need to do more? Power tool. Power tool. So first stays the same. What's the derivative of the second? Plus second stays the same. What's the derivative of the first? So you might have a squared sign there and positive, yeah? All right, cool. So A is good. B, 
Suppose x and y both vary with time. And the y increases with time increases intentional time five minutes per second lines they want the x be t and x is pi over two okay I got you so do I can I reuse my part a or do I need to go back and totally redo my derivative I'm, I need to redo the derivative what did I take the derivative I used y prime notation but what did I really take the derivative with respect to with x. So I need to go back and take the derivative with respect to time. So if I take the derivative with respect to time, what is the derivative of 2e to the cosine of x with respect to time? There's a subtle chain rule in here. 2e we, to the cosine of x. We just took the derivative of the outside, right? Now take the derivative of the inside. Negative sine of x. Now take the derivative of the very inside. The x dt. Okay, so there's actually a double chain rule on there. Um, now then, we know this is phi. This x is pi over 2. And that leaves you with the x dt. Assuming you can do your trig well, you should be able to. Are we good? 25. Is 25 still a question? Find coordinates of the absolute max. Study. Absolute max is actually. Did I write any notes here or did I leave it? Uh, yeah, so, second derivative test of this is x5. Okay. I'm going to change that. Uh, uh, I. Uh, first derivative test can be used with skill to find absolute extreme of the second derivative test to not. So, um, let's, do you mind if I just change it to relative max? Yes, you did. Oh, I did? Oh, yeah. I just oh, I did. No. You breached me. Oh, <laughs> Alrighty then. X e to the negative kx. Relative max by second derivative test. Now we're ready. Yes? Okay. Can somebody please just uh, explain to me the big idea of the second derivative test? You justify a max by second derivative by showing what two things happen. First derivative, the first derivative is zero, which implies the horizontal tangent. And the second derivative is negative to fly, imply that at that flat spot it's constantly down, right? Okay, so we first need to find the first derivative zeros. So product rule of first stays the same. Derivative of the second. What's the derivative of e to the negative kx? e to the negative kx times negative k plus second stays the same. Derivative of the first. Um, in terms of where we're headed, will it, would it be beneficial to clean this up a little bit? Probably, if, if you're going to find the second derivative especially, and the zeros, it's probably better to clean it up. So, what's the greatest common factor? E to the negative kx. When you pull that out, what's left in the first product? Negative kx into the second? One. All right. Uh, in terms of the zero product rule, or zero factor theorem, depending on your text, can the first thing be zero? No. Can the second thing be zero? What is it zero at? One over k. Okay. All right. So we have one horizontal tangent. Now we need the second derivative to talk about what's going on at that horizontal tangent. I'm going to take the derivative on this factored form so I don't have to do quite so much work. First stays the same. Derivative of the second is just negative k. Plus second stays the same. Derivative of the first is e to the negative kx times negative k. Paula? Yes. Clean it up or just throw 1 over k in? Clean it up. Clean it up. All right. So why double? I heard a little mixture. Uh, I think you'll agree that they both have a negative k and an e to the negative kx. See? When I pull that out, I'm left with 1. When I pull that out, I'm left with 
negative kx plus 1. So negative k e to the negative kx, 2 minus kx is a very clean second root on relatively. We cool? Great. Now what do I do again? I kind of lost sight of my goal here now that I've done so much second derivative work. What do I do? Set it equal to 0 or put in 1 over k? Put in 1 over k into the second derivative. I get negative k e to the what is negative kx times 1 over k? Negative 1, 2 minus what's um, kx times 1 over k? k, sorry, not kx, k times 1 over k. All right, that said, maybe that's enough to see the sign, positive or negative? Negative. negative. And that implies that concave down was flat. So we would say y, or the original curve, has a relative max at x equal 1 over k because the prime is 0 and y double is Yeah? Alright, 25 check. 18. Is 18 still a question? Yes, it is. Alright, so on to 73. Uh, I think there's only one replacement there. I'll give you the answer to that. Actually, I haven't done any of this. One, you said anything else? 10. 10. Right here? 15. 15. 15. 19. 19. 20. Or did you say 20 or 23? 20. 20. 24, 18. Right. Okay. Uh, so number three, real quick, thinking that, how do I get, how do I get to the height equation given acceleration? Integrate. You should ex integrate acceleration. Oops. And did you get one third t plus two squared plus c for the velocity? Cube, excuse me, cube. Um, the initial velocity is three feet per second at time zero. Does that imply c is three? No. No, you actually have to put in three equals one third zero. to put in the initial condition and C is one third. So the velocity is one third T plus two cubed plus a third. We Alright, now on to the height we go. How do you find height? Integrate V. Uh, one third T plus two cubed plus a third. So that is something like 1 12th t plus 2 to the 4th plus a third t plus a new constant, yeah? All right, uh, the initial condition there is 10 equals 1 12th of 2 to the 4th plus 0 plus c2. Oui. Uh, that's 16 12, so 4 thirds. So C2 is 30 thirds minus 4 thirds, so 26 thirds, yes? So the height equation is 1 12 T plus 2 to the 4th plus a third T plus 26 thirds. And now the height of T seconds is only 1 12 uh, 5 to the 4th. Uh, plus 1 plus 26 thirds, 625 twelfths plus 12 twelfths plus 4, what do you got there? 104 twelfths, 729, 741 twelfths. You agree? That reduces, doesn't it? Did I make a mistake? Oh, oh, reduced is? Yeah. 
So three goes into it for sure. So if you do that, two, four, yeah, I agree. 247 over four. All right. Ben, you're there. You're Okay. So how about one? Is one a question, Steve? Yes. Okay. Does anybody want, so they have a can here, and the volume needs to be 432 pi, and they give you information about the cost of the top and the bottom. The hardest part is usually for students to get the cost equation. Um, is cost, does cost depend on area? Yes. Does cost equal surface area? No, it's more complicated than that. So cost depends on area, but it's not equal to it. So let's talk about the cost of the top and the bottom. There are two things that go into the cost of the top and the bottom. What are they? The material, the cost of the material itself per square centimeter, and then... Okay, so you know the cost per square centimeter, then you'd also need to know number of square centimeters. With me? So you're going to need to use $8 per square centimeter and then know how many square centimeters. So how many square centimeters to the top and bottom? Two, pi, r, squared. Almost great. And if I got to be terrible. All right, so here we go. What about the cost of the sides? Cost of the side. There's only one side. So it's $1 per square centimeter for the material. And now we need the area for how much material? What's the area of a side of a can? You can unwrap, yeah. When you unwrap a can's label, it looks like a rectangle, eh? What's the bottom edge of that rectangle? Circumference. So 2 pi r and the height h. Obviously, I could use pi d, but that's a little more of a label. So it's better to use r. Lee? Okay. All righty then. There's the cost function, but it, it depends on r and h. They want it in terms of, oops, did they say r is 10? Sorry. Uh, they call it the radius. They don't read the question. Um, so they say that this then, I'm going to replace this a little bit, 16 pi x squared plus 2 pi xy, <coughs> if I use x for r and y for height. Now, that's three variables. How do we get it down to two? What's another relationship besides the cost? Volume. If the volume is 432 pi, and that equals, formulaically, x squared pi r squared or pi x squared y, then we could solve that for y. We? Y is 432 pi over x squared. So cost is 16 pi x squared plus 2 pi x times 432 over x squared, 32 pi. Oh, the pies dropped out, right. Good call. No pie. Okay, thank you. All right. So let's take the derivative on 16 pi x squared plus 864 x to the negative first. Which is the cleaned up version, yes? All right. Does that get you going? Was that the hard part? A or no, I can't take a derivative with the power rule if you want to be willing to admit that. Aha. See, I told you it's not. All right, I will assume, giving you a huge benefit of the doubt, that the power rule derivative is not the issue, that it's the algebra that is the issue. How do you solve the equation 32 pi x minus 864 over x squared? Or where is zero or undefined? Yes. 
There is. You're absolutely correct. Thank you. Good call. Thank you. That would have hurt. Thank you. All right. What else we got here, people? Factor out. I'm not a big factor out. Let's clear the fractions, shall we? So would you agree, first of all, critical number is zero because the derivative is undefined there, but is that a is that an actual possibility? No. <laughs> yeah, you can't get a volume of 364 within zero the radius of zero. So that's not even in the domain. So that's goners. Say we cleared the fractions then. It isn't this three thirty-two pi x cubed minus eight hundred and sixty-four pi. So isn't x then the cube root of eight sixty four over thirty two? Is that going evenly? Two thirty two two twenty four. Is that going evenly? Seems like it does. So we throw an answer up here, and I was hoping it was like twenty seven. I guess not. It is 27? All right, so 3 then is the perfect x. Lee? All right, if it, that is a max, a min rather, I think you'll agree that because when x is smaller than that, this would be negative, and when x is greater than that, this is positive. So that is a min. We're cool. We can finish it up. All right, um, 10. Is 10 still a question? We? Alrighty then. Ten. Uh, this is quick enough. Okay. Let's make our life easier first. This is definitely uh, make your life easier. Um, x squared minus nine. Uh, I would love it. Forget the absolute value for now. What does that graph look like? It's a hyperbola. If I remember back to this first week of school, we talked about weird, wacky forms of hyperbolas and different equations. Okay, so this is a hyperbola, but because it's square rooted with a positive, it's only positive y values. Yeah? You're down. Okay, so now that said, actually, pause for this cool math. Um, in behavior wise, when x gets infinitesimally large, what does negative 9 mean to infinitely large? Does negative 9 do jack anything to infinitely large? No. Okay, so you would say that as x gets infinitely large, this doesn't even matter, and y starts to approach just square root of x squared, or x, which is what we call a asymptote. Yeah, it follows asymptotes, not because the math teacher said, oh, let's make the graph pretty. Okay, it's, it follows asymptotes because that's the end of it. It behaves linearly at the outside. Okay, not so much in here because negative 9 has a big effect on little numbers. So it's curving here, but out here, it's almost linear. All right, uh, side note. That said, back to this problem. Does the absolute value do anything for me? Is it necessary? It is not necessary because I already took the positive of the square root. The absolute value is doing a big fat nothing. Ignore it. And now just take the derivative. One half x squared minus nine to the negative one half times two x and you are done. The absolute value is trying to confuse you there. You down? All right. 15. 15. It did. It got you. So sad. All right. Um, this one tends to get people because they overreach. All right. Now, most people think, okay, I'm going to use u sub, but the question is, Shall you let u be this? If you do, are you cool with your du? 
Is that whole thing there for a DU? No, you are in trouble. Okay, so you overreached on your DU, on your U choice. What should you let U equal so your DU is actually there? Cosine, just cosine. So that DU is, yeah, you pick up a negative, but you can deal with that by moving it over. Is it, when you make that substitution, manageable? U cubed plus 1 to negative DU. Is that integrable? It is. So you would integrate that, and it would be something like negative u to the fourth over 4 minus u. And then you sub back, and you've got something like cosine. You down? All righty then. Uh, 19. 19. Is 19 still a question? Yes? 19. How did this go as far as the intersections? We're meeting tangent with some kind of funky cosine, yeah? Did you get the intersection point? What was the intersection point? In part pi over 4. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so pi over 4. We and which area is it there on the y-axis? So we're talking this region, yeah? <coughs> if we use x, how many integrals? Draw the rectangles. If we use x, how many integrals? If we use y, how many integrals? What should we use? X. X. All right, so we're going to integrate from 0 to pi over 4 upper minus lower for the heights, and dx is the base of the rectangle. What's upper minus lower? There's tangent of x. Okay, uh, at some point we should probably just throw this in our notes so we need, don't need to keep integrating this. How do you integrate tangent? Sine over cosine, u sub, and it eventually is one of two things, either negative log of cosine, or the more common thing you'd actually see in the text is the log of the absolute value of secant. This is definitely worth committing to memory, so you don't have to keep u subbing the bejeebies out of tangent. The inverse, the antiderivative of tangent is log of secant. Here's the notes. Okay, it doesn't actually appear in the book until like step one hundred. Uh, that said, then our antiderivative is root 2 sine of x minus log of absolute value of secant. Cool. That is root 2, what's sine of pi over 4? Root 2 over 2, which is 12. Minus log of what's secant of pi over 4? Two over root two or root two minus what's sine of zero? Zero and what's secant of zero? One. Oops, the log of that is zero. So I get something like what is root two times root two over two? One minus log of root two. If you didn't see your answer, it's possible they're using log rules, calling this two to the one half and bringing it down, you might see something like that is an answer to something like that. Down. Cool. All righty then. 19, checkity check. 20. Is 20 still a question? We know you need 20. So many questions. Okay. You've got this here, x to the fourth graph. Here's y equal 4. Now you're revolving that about the y-axis. So you get a solid of revolution, which is found by adding all these little super thin disks. All right, so the volume is the sum of many pi r squared h's. 
the radius. It is constantly varying. What would you say the radius is? <coughs> the function, yes, in y terms. So if the radius is the function each time, but it needs to be in y terms, then it is the fourth root of y. What is the height of each of those solvents? dy. Anytime you go around the y-axis, you should be using y as the variable of integration. What are the limits on y? 0 to 4. Almost there. Let's clean up. What is uh, the fourth root of y squared? y to the 1 half. Integrate that, and you should be rolling. Uh, 24. Question on 24. Yes, no, maybe so. All right, 24. Reflection point at zero, negative two, and relative max at negative one, zero. Um, the hard part of these is each of these facts needs to be used twice over here. And students tend to not see both uses. Um, when I say there's an inflection point at 0, negative 2, it's tempting to get into second derivative mode too quick and think, well, inflection point, second derivative, so boom, boom, boom. Is 0, negative 2 a fact or a point on the original curve, or is that a point on the second derivative? Okay, so don't fail to use this as an actual point. This implies that negative 2 is 0 plus 0 plus That right there, a point on the curve, tells you that c is negative 2. Now it also tells you that the second derivative at 0 is changing signs, but on a polynomial, it's because it's 0, not undefined. You with me? I'm going to probably need the first and second derivative. 3x squared plus 2ax plus b. And we'll learn that in a moment. 6x plus 2a. All right. So if we use or interpret this as f double at 0 should be 0, then what does that mean as an equation? There's f double. f double at 0 should be 0. So 0 equals. 0 plus 2a. 0 equals 0 plus 2a. Certainly a must be 0. Cool. All right. Relative max. Again, that's two facts they're giving you, not one. First of all, is that, I know relative max could be first derivative, but is that a point on the curve? And so as a point, that would imply 0 equals negative 1. This is gone because A is 0. Minus B minus 2 equals 0. We And therefore, B is negative 3. We didn't have to get into the first derivative. I wonder that's kind of weird. I was expecting that to take me to first derivative. So the function is x cubed. That's gone, minus 3x, minus 2. You down? Okay. Okay, uh, 18, is 18 still a question? You are a needy bunch of weasels today, I'll tell you what. So, probably would have been good to do 18 before we did 20 or 19, because you needed 18 to do 19, but here we go. Can you... So guess and check is a terrible. But um, how could you solve this algebraically? This goes this is a good a major trig test for you. Split up tangent to sine over cosine. Okay, split up tangent to be sine over cosine. And then can you divide by cosine to make it like sine over tangent cosine? Okay, or I'm going to instead multiply so I can get rid of fractions, but I'm with you. I understand. 
In trig, you dealt with this problem of two different trig functions. What do you deal with the problem of two different trig functions? There you go. Boom. All right, so if I get everything on one side, I get root 2 sine squared plus sine of x plus root 2. We, if you're really on your game, that does factor. What are the factors of root 2 sine squared? Root 2 sine of x times sine of x. Wait. What are the factors of root 2? Root 2 and 1. Now the question is, should I go root 2 and 1 here, or 1 and root 2? Well, you want it to clean up all roots. So how would I organize it to dump the roots? 1 here and root 2 there. That implies sine of x is negative 1 over root 2, or negative root 2 over 2. Negative? That's unexpected. 5 pi over 2? Did I make a sine error? But I'm not getting... Pi over 4 is the solution, right? I'm not getting pi over 4 if I get what did I do wrong? Oh, this is negative, that's why. Okay, I got you. So there, that's why it caused it. All right, so pi over 4, boom, we're good. All right, uh, let's throw some real quick. Now, we probably won't get to answers on 74A, yeah? Okay, but let's at least get some answers. What do you say? Did you get something like C? should. Did you get something like 187.328 units cubed? Yes. Yes. May I move on? Yes. Okay. Uh, let's go here. What is the meaning of A? Or what is the, what is this equal to? Area, assigned area, net area, or total area? What do you want, dude? Oh, I turn the bar back. Okay. Uh, it might be in there or in the blue folder. Sign. Uh, sign. So 10 minus 50, so negative 40. What do you get when you say, what kind of rate times times with sign? Do I get distance or displacement? Okay, this is the displacement in meters from time 0 seconds to time 10 seconds. We? All right. This is 60, and it's the distance in meters from time dot, 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 dot. What's the last thing? Height at time 0 plus change in height gives Height at time 10. That's the position at time 10. Height at time 10. Initial plus change gives you n. If the initial was 70 and the change was negative 40, then you should have said 30. And this is the height at in meters at time 10. Second. Sweet. Last but not least, let's see how these went. Uh, 3 million. Okay. Newtons. 5 million. All right. We'll finish going over 74A on Monday. 72B and 73 are due today. Have a super three-day weekend. Enjoy it. Yes, you can. did you find it?
Have a good weekend. Bye.